also establishing the right way of doing things. <laughs> you shall prepare my food, wife. Every day. And I shall enjoy it. A girl's pure feelings do not belong in your hands. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. As always, I'm your host, Simon. Welcome to the show. I'm here. One of my writers in this case. Scroll down on the front. Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. I had to scroll down to see who it was by. Things, uh, <coughs> get it right, Simon. Things Japanese people think are totally normal, but others find bizarre. Okay, then. <laughs> Normally, we have like one of these, and I feel like I approve it. It's like, okay, well, things American people find weird that the British find normal or blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, the reason I do that is because Americans and British people are a big part of the audience. Hello, guys. Japanese people. I'm going to imagine it's less so. I don't know what the percentage of people watching this content are that are Japanese. Hello, friends. But I don't imagine it's that many. Right? my dear friend. Like most American nerds, I've always wanted to visit Japan. Yeah, it is like, an, it is like a nerd's right. Why is Japan... Is it because of anime and that, that kind of shit? Is that why Japan's so popular? I want to visit Japan because of that uh, Lost in Translation movie, one of my favorite films. Bill Murray, Scarlett Johansson. I'm a nerd for that movie. Sadly, like the majority of Americans, I also don't even have a passport, so this is yet to happen. But life in Japan is much different than life in America, so if I ever do make it, I need to be prepared. I have to say, I always thought it was a bit weird that, you know, Americans like, like Kevin, doesn't have a passport, doesn't travel abroad. And I'm like, as a European, I'm like, that's so weird. Like, I live abroad, and I've been to like many, many dozens of countries. And then I realized America's really big. America's like the size of Europe, and it's also really different. Like if you're in, Kevin lives in Massachusetts, as he brings up many times, and that's like on the opposite side of the country to somewhere like California. California's really different. And then I imagine like Texas is different and whatever the countries are in the, the, the top left, they're different as well. Because America's really big. There's lots of shit to do in America. This is the United States of America, for God's sake. The UK is like this big, so we have to go abroad to see things. We've talked a lot about things that American and British think are normal, but nobody else does. So let's take a look at some of the bizarre things that I might need to shrug off if I ever make it to Japan. And yes, we're going to start with the first thing that came to everybody's mind. The first thing that came to my mind, which... Is that, is that actually a real thing? There are like vending machines that sell used underwear. And I'm like, surely that's not a real thing. Is Kevin going to address this? Uh, yes. <laughs> Everybody's right when they clicked on this video. Vending machines. Yes, let's go. One of the things Japan is best known for is its vending machines and with good cause. While not quite as omnipresent as they once were, at one point there was one vending machine for every 23 citizens. Holy shit. Vending machines are just... I, I, the only time I ever use a vending machine is like I'm in a shopping center and I want to buy a Coke. There are lots of reasons that the Japanese love their vending machines, and honestly, it makes a lot of sense. Vending machines are really convenient, and they first started exploding throughout Japan at a time when everything closed really early. By 8 p.m., cities would be largely shutting down, so vending options were for late night shopping. Really? 8 o'clock? Like, what if you need to get some KFC at 3 in the morning? What are you supposed to do? And I know you love KFC in Japan. I made a video about your love of KFC. Or maybe it's just at Christmas. Japanese people have KFC for Christmas. Weird. Ah, oh, another reason I want to go to Tokyo. Love to go to Tokyo is they have a KFC buffet where you go in and it's just like you help yourself to KFC. Apparently it's the only one in the world. And I really want to go there because of that. I know it's, it's a long flight just to go to a KFC buffet. I'd also go to that hotel where they shot Lost in Translation. And then I'd come home. And I'd be like, cool, Japan done. Boom, checked off. Easy. Weekend. Failure is your destiny. They were also incredibly easy to install. There weren't any regulations in place for most products that were being sold. So long as you didn't install it in a place that was blocking traffic or something, then anybody could get a vending machine. Oh my god, that sounds like a nightmare. Like, permits are important. Otherwise, you get all sorts of crazy sh** all over the place. <laughs> like, vending machines. Like, why is this here? It's so ugly. It's like if someone installed a vending machine outside your apartment, they'd be like, what the f***, man? I'm trying to enjoy my apartment building and there's now vending machine selling used underwear what the f <sighs> well you just smell good all the time <laughs> this was actually treated by many people as a side business because of how easy it was all you had to do was call a vending machine company and ask to have a machine put somewhere like in front of your house they would install and service the machine and all you had to do was provide the electricity for a get for it to get a cut of the profits people felt like this was a pretty sweet deal which led to vending machines being installed everywhere that sounds horrible i'm glad that they obviously i, I guess they introduced some rules at some point because there's like 23 vending machines machines for every person no that's not right <laughs> that would be insane 23 citizens for every vending machine 
That's wild. Of course, what happened to all the old vending machines? When they're like, they obviously introduced some legislation. They're like, we got thousands, millions of vending machines. Don't like 200 people, million people live in Japan. They got millions of vending machines. What the f are we going to do with them all? Don't know. Send them to some other, bury them at sea, blow them up. Of course, the thing Japan is most known for is the wide variety of items you can get from said vending machines. Sure, you can get your normal vending machine drinks like soda, hot coffee, iced coffee, milk, and so on. But there's plenty of hot foods too. Craving a late night burger, pizza, or bowl of ramen? There's a vending machine for that. Or if you want to do your own cooking, you can always stop by a vending machine to grab some fresh eggs. Have I told this story before? <laughs> Like, I was in America. I was taking a great... I did, like, a big trip on the great... I've definitely talk, talked about this before. Have I told about my vending machine story with the prisoner? And I was like, I was at a vending... It was a, it was a Greyhound station in, like, somewhere in the south, in the middle of nowhere. And it was just, like, some stop that we had, like, overnight, me and my mate. And so we're wait, waiting in this Greyhound station for, like, our connecting bus. And there's, like, there's nothing open. It's, like, 3 o'clock in the morning. But it's still, like, the Greyhound station is still busy. It's like, what's going on? But there's vending machines. And so we go over to one of the vending machines, and it sells, like, hot food. Like, hot dogs and sh**. And I'm like to my mate, dude, you see this? There's, like, hot dogs in here. That's gross. Like, why would you buy a hot dog, bro? A hot, hot dog from a vending machine. And some guy just chimes in behind us, and he's like, better than what I've been eating for the last six years. And I'm like, at first I didn't get it. And then I realized, oh, <laughs> He's a prisoner. He's just been released from prison and he's going to get his hot dog from the vending machine and enjoy it. <laughs> oh, it was like, it was a long time. It was, it was years. I can't remember exactly how many, but I was like, I, I didn't put it together. And then I was like, yeah, yeah, okay, mate. <laughs> and apparently when you get released from prison in America, I'm not sure if this is true, but they apparently give you a Greyhound ticket to wherever you want to go and $25. At least that's the legend that I've heard. And that's why this guy's in this vending, uh, in this uh, Greyhound station. He's just waiting to hop on a, hop on a bus with his vending machine hot dog, he's gonna be like, oh yeah, so good. And uh, yeah, that's the end of the story, let's carry on. Fascinating tangent, Simon, let's carry on. It's more than food, though. Maybe a car drove through a puddle of mud and ruined your outfit on your way to work. Luckily, there's vending machines filled with socks, shirts, and dress ties as well. Or if you're lonely and need a friend, there are plenty of vending machines stocked with live, live rhinoceros beetles, a popular pet among Japanese children. <laughs> is a rhinoceros beetle that just leaves the big question can you really buy girls used panties from vending machines in japan well probably not at least not anymore but there are machines that certainly want tourists to think that that's what they're buying the myth of the used panty vending machine seems to exist at the crossroads of two very real phenomena assuming that it is even a myth there are absolutely vending machines that sell things like panties and cosplay outfits and there are even vending machines full of panties that have the words used on them however used is the single word on those vending machines that's written in English. The Japanese text right next to it makes clear that they are designed to look as if they're used, but they aren't really. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> what sort of weird fetish are you into that you're like, yes, yes, used panties. It's just like, I, I don't want to sh like, what's the like, people say like kink shaming. It's like, that. but like, used panties, bro, come on. <laughs> But that's still only half the story. Until a recent crackdown, there was a very large and at least mostly legal market for used panties, socks, and schoolgirl uniforms. <laughs> Guys, such high-value items were likely kept behind the counter rather than placed in vending machines, but they were definitely for sale at your local sex shop. School and sex shop should never be used in the same sentence, guys. <laughs> Come on now. Come on, Japan. <laughs> <laughs> and there are absolutely vending machines that want to, although I suppose that's a fairly large genre of pornography, isn't it? Like, yeah. <laughs> Which is weird, to be honest, isn't it? Like, <laughs> this is some weird... Like, why? Why, when you go on, like, you know, your favorite naughty website, why is Step Family such a popular thing? Like, I, who would have predicted this? <laughs> And people in the comments are probably like, well, because I, I, I just like it. <laughs> I like the storylines. <laughs> it's like, why? It's called hentai, and it's art. <laughs> Obviously, people do, at large scale. Though vending machines began declining in popularity when prices in most for most items rose beyond a single coin, they seem to be picking up again thanks to the incorporation of digital payment options. So if you're ever walking down the streets in Kyoto and find yourself caught in an unexpected thunderstorm, fear not, you could just grab an umbrella from a nearby vending machine. Thank God.
Simon's favorite holiday. Okay. Oh, I know what this is. This must be about Christmas and the meeting KFC. Let's go. Over the past few decades, Christmas has become massively popular in Japan, despite the fact that only about 1% of the country is actually Christian. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> Well, to be fair, I'm not Christian, and I've celebrated Christmas like every year of my life. It's just nice. You give people gifts and shit, and you're like, woo, look, Father Christmas and trees and Jesus. And Jesus doesn't really have much to do with it in my family. It's just like, just gifts and shit. <laughs> To be fair, Christmas has transcended religion to become a worldwide celebration of consumerism and greed. Yes, my, it's like, look, no one likes Jesus. Everybody loves consumerism and greed. Get with the program. But it is celebrated extremely differently in Japan. To start, Christmas Eve is the most important ho- is a more important holiday than Christmas itself, though neither of them are officially national holidays. Same here. I live in uh, Czech Republic in Prague, and. Uh, 24th is when everyone exchanges gifts and celebrates. It's weird for me because 25th is Christmas, but it all it all goes down on the 24th. It's it's, uh, it's different. It's not unusual to me. Japan, me, same page. So now I will be Japanese. Domo, I'm Japanese. I am a Japanese man. I am a Japanese man. Christmas Eve is essentially Japan's Valentine's Day, though they also have two other Valentine's Days as well. That was rubbish. <laughs> Making an effort three days a year. Christ off, Japan. It's the most important holiday for love and romance, and it is celebrated by couples around the country who go out to fancy restaurants for dinner, then take romantic strolls through the park and whatnot. But Christmas itself is a different story entirely. When it comes to traditional Christmas dinner, Simon probably thinks of roasted turkey and all of the stuff that we Americans eat for Thanksgiving. Yes, you have the big roast turkey on Thanksgiving. We have it on Christmas. The correct holiday for turkey, America. Come on. While some Americans also have turkey for Christmas, oh, good for you. You're the correct Americans. While our American audience is more likely to think of ham or even a nice, nice beef roast. Yeah, honestly, I'd rather have beef. To be honest, like, beef is the best. Turkey's fine. I'm not a giant fan of turkey, but beef. But in Japan, the only food anyone thinks of on Christmas is the Colonel's 11 herbs and spices. That's right, I'm talking about Kentucky Fried Chicken. To be clear, I'm not talking about any old fried chicken that you could buy yourself at a store or make. Christmas in Japan is celebrated by the entire country eating KFC. It's a tradition that was begun in 1970 by Takeshi Okawara, the store manager of the country's first KFC franchise. He began advertising a Christmas party barrel, which became one of the most successful advertising campaigns since De Beers tricked everyone into the thinking that diamonds had any actual value or rarity. Yeah, De Beers is such a f***ing scam. Also, what's up? You don't have KFC buckets, you have KFC barrels? A barrel's larger than a bucket. I'll take it. KFC, get on that. Let's do some barrels over here in Europe. Some people may be thinking that fast food on Christmas isn't bizarre at all. After all, Chinese food is the Christmas tradition for America's Jewish population, but that tradition was born from necessity as Chinese restaurants were the only thing open on Christmas. It's also the difference between something done by about 2% of the country's population versus something done by nearly 100% of Japan's population. Whoa. So this is like, I, I didn't realize it was quite so like absolutely dominant. The guy who started this at KFC is a business genius. KFC is so popular on Christmas there that if you want to celebrate the tradition yourself, you'd better call up your local KFC and order your Christmas dinner weeks or even months in advance. It's either that or show up unannounced like an idiot and have to wait in line for hours praying that they don't run out of food before you get your party barrel. If you need additional perspective on just how ubiquitous this tradition has become, according to KFC's 2019 financial reports, their sales in Japan on Christmas accounted for 10% of their total sales in the country for the entire year. 10%! One day! Needless to say, Okawara quickly became the CEO of KFC Japan after coming up with this idea. Yeah. Well, he's also the guy who opened the first franchise, so he seems like the right guy to be the CEO. Blood type personality theory. This isn't a thing. I don't even I don't actually know what my blood type is. I've never had it tested. I can't give blood here for some reason. There was some, there's some like. I could do it in the UK, but I can't do it here because there's some rule against, like, British people or something giving blood because of some reason. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> just, I just want to be helpful. I don't have any blood diseases, I don't think. Don't really know. Never had my blood tested. I don't know what blood type I am. Fear the old blood. If you're an American, you're more than likely to know your astrological sign. That's a Taurus, baby! I know my astrological sign, and it means f***ing nothing. 
You small, smooth brains. Are you more likely to know your astrological sign than your blood type? Only 50 to 60% of Americans claim to know their blood type, although that's still better than Great Britain, where only 40% of people claim to know it. I've just had no reason to know my blood type. I'd like to know it. I just don't know it. Like, uh, if I need blood, they'll just give me the O negative blood? The generic one? <laughs> generic, not generic. Um... A uh, universal, universal one. And then when they'll test my blood, they'll find out what blood type I am, and then they'll give me the specific one. Boom. Easy. But if you intend to visit Japan, you should probably find out what your blood type is, because you're going to be asked about it a lot. The Japanese are rather obsessed with a person's blood type, thanks to their common belief in blood type personality theory. It's basically the same thing as astrology, except using only four blood types instead of 12 astrological signs. It's also vaguely sciencey. So it's kind of got that, like, sciencey ring to it. It's like, yeah, yeah, blood type, like phrenology. <laughs> It's vaguely sciencey sounding, so let's it's more legit. Whereas astrology's just like made up shit. On the one hand, this makes slightly more sense than things like astrology, since your blood is actually a part of you. But <laughs> thank you, Kevin. But on the other, it's trying to boil down every different person into just four main personality types. This isn't a new idea, as its origins can be traced back at least as far as Aristotle, though it wasn't as widespread as other superstitions. I recently found out. You know that whole thing about personality types? Um Oh, f what's it called? There's some big personality test, which gives you like one of these 20 different personality types and they have like four letters. They'll call you like an ENTF or TNFP or something like this. Fuck, the name's right there. Myers-Briggs. Myers-Briggs personality type. A friend of mine's super into this. He's always like, ah, oh, yeah, this type. Yeah, that type. Yeah, this type. I found out it's just pseudoscience. Psychology has largely debunked it. And it kind of makes sense when you think, when you think about it. Because, I mean, at first I was like, yeah, yeah, okay, this seems to work. And he'd be like, you are this personality trait. And I'm like, I do. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm into pseudoscience now. Because psychology has largely do been done with this. They're like, no, it's kind of a joke. We don't, we don't, it's just pseudo. It's like, if you look up chiropractory, chiropractic, chiropracy, chiropractoring, whatever it is, you know, like bone cracking or whatever. Wikipedia is going to be like pseudoscience. Same thing with the Mars Briggs thing. And I'm like, holy sh Okay, and it makes sense because like humans we're really complicated. We don't just fit in like 20 different boxes We're complicated after all blood already has an important role to play in keeping a person alive What we talk our oh, blood type personalities, okay Didn't it make more sense to ascribe a person's personality to stars and planets? I mean what the f else would they be there for? <laughs> I don't know, carrying oxygen molecules around our body, carrying carbon dioxide, platelets and sh**. White blood cells? I don't know. All sorts of other sh** other than determining our personality, which I'm fairly sure is done in the brain. You know, that, that, that big thinking thing in your head. Despite obviously just being superstition and pseudoscientific nonsense, it is exceedingly popular in Japan to the point that your blood type may be among the first things somebody asks you. It's just an easier way to get to know your personality than actually talking to you. But there's but on the more than four types, there's loads of blood types. Aren't there like 12? There's like A, A+, plus, A++, plus plus, A+, plus negative, A, B, negative all sorts there's like a big table of them and they tell you which ones are compatible with the different ones and it's like i always thought it's like best to be ab negative or ab positive the one that's the universal recipient because then it's like you could take anybody's blood no problem you can't give blood to anyone except the other people like you which is not very many but it's like you can receive blood which is good if you're o negative you can only have o negative blood which is a bit rubbish like i mean it's good to be able to give it but it's like well if you, you could need that you know why well, if you need the blood and they don't have any of your specific type? Whereas the selfish one, you take it all. That's why I want the selfish, I want the greedy blood type. Maybe there is something to be said about this blood type thing. <laughs> While there's still regular astrology as well, horoscopes based on blood type rather than star signs are extremely common. Of course, not everybody believes this insanity, but polls show that nearly a third of men and nearly half of women do, and sometimes it can be taken entirely too seriously. Blood types can make or break relationships, with many people weighing the compatibility of different blood types more heavily than their actual experience with the person they're dating. <laughs> So insane. <laughs> While crazy, that's not any different than choosing dating partners based on zodiac size. That's it, which is also crazy. Like, what the f***? <laughs> which is something that definitely happens. But it's going much further than that. School children may be bullied over their blood type, particularly if they're unfortunate enough to have type B blood. <laughs> type B? That's the blood of peasants! Type B is seen as selfish and generally undesirable, and anybody born with this blood type could have a difficult time making friends. So just lie! Just lie! They can't see it! They're not looking at you being like, oh, blood type. They're just, just lie! Just be like, I'm the best blood type. I'm A. Or O. Or fucking whatever. Just lie. It's not hard. Just lie. Just be like, just, just make that shit up.
You disrespect yourself and your nation. Employers have also been known to ask an applicant's blood type during interviews. A person's blood type was one of the stock questions that you could expect for any entry-level position for decades. Many companies continue to ask this despite regulatory bodies telling them to cut that sh out. Not only did blood types inform hiring decisions, employers were known to sort their workers into different roles based on their blood types. In addition, athletes will receive different training regimens based on their blood types, and schools will teach differently to people with different blood types. The list of things that people tie to blood types just seems to be endless. While it's possible that how serious the Japanese people take blood types is somewhat exaggerated, the fact that I could tell you the blood type of many anime or video game characters, despite never actually seeking out this information, shows that at least it's important enough to be included in a lot of their entertainment media as a replacement for character developments. Yet, yeah, do you think Japanese books just start? Here is Michael. He is blood type A. I was like, <laughs> cool. Michael's character is established. Boom. Everything is clean. How weird this is going to seem depends on exactly where you live, as there are a few countries in the world like this. Even in the United States, it varies from city to city, but I personally don't find to be America to be terribly clean. I mentioned this many times. I went to Seattle, expecting it to be like this nice, beautiful, modern city. It was so dirty and nasty. Seattle, why? <laughs> like, I don't know, it just didn't seem very nice. <laughs> and don't get me wrong, like... Like the UK is pretty grotty in itself, so I'm I'm not I'm not shitting on America too hard. But Seattle, man, what a dump! And apparently, I, I feel like people think Seattle's one of the nice cities. Los Angeles was a lot nicer than Seattle. At least the weather's nice. Sure, we have street sweepers and stuff like that that will come through at night to make things look a bit nicer. But in the middle of the day, litter is easy to find. There are cigarette butts everywhere, empty bottles and cans thrown around, empty McDonald's bags jettisoned from cars, and so on. Yes. They introduced a fantastic law in the UK. There's on-the-spot fines. So I think, I can't remember what the fine is, but if you drop a cigarette butt on the ground, which when I was a kid was just common. You put smoke, put it on the ground, stamp it out with your foot. This was entirely common practice. And now I think it's a 60 pound or 80 pound on-the-spot fine, so you can't argue the police are just like, saw you do that, 80 pound fine, mate. And so now there are much less cigarette butts on the ground, which is nice, because that was that was horrible. But in Japan, everything is pretty much immaculate. What makes this particularly unusual is the public trash cans are few and far between. You may find them at parks or by some vending machines, but even then, they're mainly just for recycling cans and bottles, not for actual trash. The lack of trash cans is becoming increasingly common in large cities worldwide due to a fear of terrorist attacks, but even after cutting down, there are still 2,000 public trash cans in Boston. In Japan, any trash you may generate should simply be kept on your person until you arrive home and can dispose of it properly. That sounds like a massive, like a Coke can? What are you supposed to do? Crush it up and then get all the weird leftover bits of coke on your hands and stuff? Like, what the f Of course, this is aided by the fact that people don't walk around while eating, as it's considered rude and inconvenient to those around them. But, ah, oh, yes, I, there's a law here. Or like a rule or whatever, I don't know what it is. You can't eat on public transport. So people will be riding like the metro, they'll be riding the tram, and if someone's eating, they will get dirty looks. Because <laughs> you're not allowed to eat or drink on uh, public transport, and it's really nice. Because you're not just going along. And there's like smell of someone's kebab. Like you're tra traveling home on the bus in the UK and someone's just like, or on the train and someone's just having a McDonald's. You're like, what the f man? I don't want to smell your food. Come on. Ooh, tell me, did you just have toast with honey on it? Because you smell all sweet, like honey. But even when it comes to other types of trash a person may be inclined to discard in public, it simply doesn't happen. Cleanliness is considered so important that it's even something kids are taught in school. Japanese students are all required to help clean the school. While some, but not all schools, do have janitors as well, it's the students that tidy and sweep, wash the windows, clean the bathrooms, and clean the cafeteria. Not only are they being taught the value of cleanliness, but also that communal spaces should be respected and looked after. By beginning to indoctrinate your kids at a young age, it leads to adults who keep their city sparkling clean. I like this a lot. Let's do that. The streets of Japan are so clean that their drainage canals are filled with koi fish. Personally, I don't know a damn thing about raising fish. When I was a kid, I went to bed one night with a tank full of baby fish only to wake up and discover half the fish had disappeared except for one exceptionally bloated catfish. Oh my god. They... <laughs> that was a night of horror for the fish in the tank. But apparently koi are notorious for requiring exceptionally clean water, so the idea that they could live in drainage canals is pretty impressive. You trying to kill us? Oh, oh, 
bundle up for summer. This next entry is just for the ladies. At the time of writing this, much of the world is facing a brutal heat wave and experiencing the hottest summer of our lifetimes. Everywhere else seems to be. Here it's been raining for two weeks. It's like autumn temperatures. It's very nice. Given the high temperatures, you should probably be grateful that you aren't currently in Japan, where women tend to wear even more during the summer months, often dressing in layers. There are a couple of reasons for this rather uncomfortable tradition. First, paler skin is considered more attractive for Japanese women, so they will fully cover themselves in the hot summer months to prevent themselves from getting a tan. In addition to wearing long pants and a shirt or two to cover their arms and torso, women will also wear either wear large hats to cover their faces or walk around with parasols to protect them from the sunlight. This is generally considered the primary reason for this behavior, and the reason only apply it only applies to women, as how pale or tan a man is doesn't matter. However, it's not the only reason. I was surprised to discover this, as I thought it was a purely American phenomenon, but apparently they like to crank up the air conditioning in Japan. It may be hot outside, but indoors the AC is pumping so hard that it quickly would become entirely too cold without the extra layers. Well, how about that? I cannot live another day without air conditioning. Says tomorrow's gonna be hotter. Yesterday you said you'd call Sears. I'll call today. You call now. Weird marriage proposals. Though this has started to change in recent years, the Japanese traditionally have preferred to be rather indirect in their speech. <laughs> Japanese and the British people. <laughs> it's like in Britain, that's quite nice. Means it's terrible. <laughs> in America, that's quite nice means it's great. It's a, one of the biggest cultural differences. Like people, are, I get an email from someone American and they'll be like, that's quite nice. And I'll be like, oh, geez, I guess I have to do it again. They're really unsatisfied or it's like, it's just not very good. But it, it means it's nice. It means like that's genuine. It's quite nice. Hey, I still can't say it without sounding like I'm trying to say it's why tell someone what you mean when you can make a vague or even bizarre statement and just hope that they understand the underlying point that you're trying to make? Exactly, Japan! <laughs> the lack of directness extended to marriage proposals, which resulted in some rather unusual ways meant about the question. For example, asking a girl, would you make miso soup for me every day, was long considered a typical way of proposing. Similarly, the man may have stated, I want to eat your home cooking for the rest of my life. <laughs> it's also establishing the right way of doing things. <laughs> You shall prepare my food, wife, every day, and I shall enjoy it. A girl's pure feelings do not belong in your hands. A pure heart should be cherished and protected from the likes of you. Those proposals don't sound very romantic, and they make it sound more like the man is interested in a servant rather than a wife. And when these phrases first came into common use, they probably, that's probably exactly what he wanted, but not all indirect proposals make the bride-to-be sound like a housekeeper. Some are more morbid, like, let's lie in the same grave. <laughs> are you proposing marriage or double suicide? <laughs> Will you change your family name to mine? Fun fact, married couples in Japan are legally required to use the same last name and they can't hyphenate. It doesn't have to be the man's name, but you've got to pick one of them and stick with it. And it usually is the man's name, as it should be. <laughs> of course, while all of these proposals have remained popular with men, they're not quite as popular with women anymore. Asking a woman to cook for you for the rest of her life may seem like a tradition, but it's unlikely to go over nearly as well as it did 20 years ago. Modern women simply would be happier being asked, will you marry me? And bonus points if you say it in English because the Japanese think English is cool and love using it any chance they can get. <laughs> English is sweet. Horrid shit! But of all the common phrases used to propose in Japan, there is one that stands head and shoulders above the rest, being the utterly ridiculous, will you wash my underwear? <laughs> From a vending machine. Ah, ah, great callback, Simon, you big brain. Thank you for being here. That's the end of the episode. I'll see you next time. I'm trying to enjoy my apartment building and there's now a fucking vending machine selling used underwear. What the f well, you just smell good all the time. Yeah,